Page 7. I'll go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. By my accumulation to the practice of giving and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. By my accumulations of the practice of giving and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge to the Dharma and the Sangha. By my accumulations of the practice of giving and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. Sanya Jodha Zoghe Jonam La Chanju Bardo Dane Gyabzuji Dage Jin Sohke Ve Sonam Ke Tola Pengir Sanya Jubare Shu Sanya Jodha Zoghe Jonam La Chanju Bardo Dane Gyabzuji Dage Jin Sohke Ve Sonam Ke Tola Pengir Sanya Jubare Shu Sanjay Chodha Soge Chonam La Chanju Pardo Tane Gyabzu Dage Jin Soge Ve Sonam Ki Dola Pengir Sanjay Du Barai Shio All phenomena are from causes. The causes are taught by the Tathagata. The cessation of causes as well as taught by the greats here. Om Ye Dharma Hetu Prabhava Hetum Te Shantathagato Chayo Niroda Eva Mati Mahashramana Yeswaha Om Ye Dharma Hetu Prabhava Hetum Te Shantathagato Hevatat Te Sham Chayo Niroda Eva Mati Mahashramana Yeswaha Om Ye Dharma Hetu Prabhava Hetum Te Shantathagato Hevatat Te Sham Chayo Niroda Eva Mati Mahashramana Yeswaha Oya Har Sutra Mantra Te Yatha Om Gati Gati Para Gati Para Sam Gati Bodhi Swaha Te Yatha Om Gadi Gadi Para Gadi Para Sam Gadi Bodhi Swaha Tiyata Om Gadi Gadi Para Gadi Para Sam Gade Bodhi Swaha Tiyata Om Gade Gade Para Gade Para Sam Gade Bodhi Swaha Tiyata Om Gati Gati Para Gati Para Sam Gati Bodhi Swaha Tiyata Om Gati Gati Para Gati Para Sam Gade Bodhi Swaha
Okay. Acharya, Acharya Chandrakirti, 7th century great saint scholar, um, in his book, Enter into the Middle Way, um, he mentioned that every phenomena has two, two truths. Every phenomena has two, two truths. This is so important. This is so important. Okay. The two truths, the two truths are, for example, for example, the flower. See the flower? Two truths, the flower. And um, one is the truth which can be seen, the truth which can be seen um, from a distance perception, from a distanced perception. Other, the truth seen from a close analysis, from distance and anal the distanced analysis and the close analysis. So the distance analysis is we call as a conventional. So what is table? The inf what is in front of you is the table. And say, um, okay, say, okay, say, the, the truth or the phenomena that exists through just gross analysis or the conven we call as, we call as, precisely we call it as the conventional analysis, which means that which means that the analysis which the conventional world accepts. For example, where is the flower? Is it in the hand? After seeing the flower, then you go beyond. When you go beyond, then you don't see anything. The object disappears. Okay, till the object exists, till the object sustains. Analysis, analysis you do till the object, till the object remains, or the, till the object is sustained. That analysis known as conventional analysis. Whereas the moment you do the analysis, any analysis, and the object disappears. That is known as ultimate analysis. Don't forget it. Any analysis, analysis employing of which the basic object of the discussion disappears. That is ultimate analysis. And the, the analysis uh, with which the, the basic object of the analysis doesn't disappear and instead is sustained is known as the conventional analysis. Okay, don't forget this. Now, uh, when I look at this object, say I, should, I hold this object, I'm not going to say this is a flower or atoms, whatever, I'm not going to say anything. I'm simply going to say that I'm holding this object. I'm holding this object and then group A and group B. Group A, group A, group A employs ultimate analysis. No, group A employs a conventional analysis and group B employs ultimate analysis, right? Okay, before that, is there anyone who can tell all of us to remind us as to what does it mean by conventional analysis? And then the next person should tell us what does it mean by ultimate analysis before going any further to make sure that we know exactly what these two mean. Only if you understand these two things, then we can move further. Otherwise, Whatever we go further, it will make you more, uh, say, the heavy, and uh, the what um, will be burdened more. Okay, tell me, anyone who likes to share with us as to what do you understand by conventional analysis? Anyone? Anyone? It's over there, Edward. Okay. Something. Um, okay, let's see. Analysis and analyzed. These two are different. Don't forget it. Character, characteristic and the characterized. Likewise, analysis and the analyzed. What is analyzed is the object, and the analysis is the analyzing mind, subject, right? So, something which is recognized. Something which is recognized. Okay, this is a good, the, the good uh, position. Um, still, I want more to speak, what do you understand by conventional analysis? Anyone? Yes. Conventional analysis has to do with anal um, analyzing a phenomena that the world accepts. Exactly. The, you, the analysis, analysis means it's not object. Object will not analyze. 
It is you analyzing, your mind analy- analyzes. So the, it's the analysis, it's the analysis which the conventional world, ordinary world will accept. For example, say, uh, what is 2 plus 2, what is 2 plus 2? The answer is 4-ish. What is 2 plus 2? The answer is 4-ish. Correct or incorrect? Huh? Those who say correct, which means you are very poor in mathematics. <laughs> okay, what is 2 plus 2 equal? Equals 4, right? So the world accepts that this is correct. 2 plus 2 equals 4. This is correct. 2 plus 2 equals 4-ish is wrong. Right? So, what the world accepts, what the conventional world accepts, that analysis is known as conventional analysis. You're getting it? On that basis, because of this conventional analysis, then the object can be identified as Edward said. Because of the conventional analysis, then the object can be identified as okay. K. Say, what is this? This is a flower, right? I want you to analyze this and to tell me what, what this is. You will say, this is a flower. So you subject, you, you, inf- you employed what? Which analysis? Conventional analysis, and because of which you are able to identify the object. You're getting it? You employ the conventional analysis and you identify the object. Now the conventional analysis means an analysis, an analysis which the conventional world accepts. Analysis which the conventional world accepts. For example, say analysis or investigation or search. Analysis, investigation, search. When you go in search of, when you go in search of, say, uh, when you go in search of, say, uh, say, Sonamla, when you go say, hey, Sonamla, where is Sonamla? He must be in Singapore. He is in Malaysia. He must be in there, this, and so forth. Then, no, 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 no. He is in Indonesia. Where in Indonesia? So, okay. He is in Indonesia. Then, the ordinary people without philosophy background, will they be happy with your answer? He is in Singapore. Will they be happy with your answer? Then they will ask the second question. They will inquire the second. Where in Indonesia? Then you will say, in Jambi. Right? Where in Jambi? In? In Murakito. Resort, right? And where in Murakito is resort? So all this analysis holds true, makes sense in the conventional world, right? Oh, in the 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 hall, teaching hall, right? Where in the teaching hall, right there at the sound system, right? Okay, now let's after seeing the the day, we're sitting right there at the sound system, you see Sunam Lal, and see where is he? Is his his eyes? his nose, his heart, his lungs, his mind, his feelings, so forth. Then what happens to Sunamla? From that point onwards, you will never find Sunamla. However refined analysis you employ, you will never find, even the Buddha will not find Sunamla from that point of view. You agree with me or not? So, at a certain point, you analyze something, then the conventional world will be shocked. What are you doing now? You have already found Sunamla and still you are looking for him. So, that after seeing Sunamla and still when you search for him, then you go beyond the conventional analysis. You be, go beyond the, how the conventional people accept that Sunamla, right? So you go beyond that, going beyond the conventional analysis is what analysis? Ultimate analysis, right? So ultimate analysis is the analysis which cannot be accepted by the ordinary people, the conventional world and that the object of analysis will disappear. Object of analysis will disappear. This is ultimate analysis. Okay, I'll, I will uh, give you some examples, and then you tell me, you decide which of the two analysis that um, it is. Okay, let's see. Oh, this flower is made of atoms. Ultimate analysis, conventional analysis. This flower is made of atoms. Huh? Conventional analysis. This flower is impermanent. Conventional ultimate. Huh? Conventional analysis. Okay. Um, I am made of my body and my mind. Conventional ultimate. Conventional? I am made of my body and mind. Conventional or ultimate? Conventional. That's true. Okay, that's conventional. Same. Um, my body is me. 
Oh, wow, my body is me. Do the conventional world accept that my body is me? My hand is me? My fingers are me? There are so many me's. I have so many fingers, ten fingers. There are so many me's. Is this what the conventional world accepts? No. Okay, tell me. Okay, where are you? Somebody is asking from outside. Hey, where is Andrew? Andrew says, I'm here. The person cannot see you. Again, he keeps calling, where are you? Then he enters. Then he sees, the person sees Andrew. After seeing Andrew, where is Andrew? After seeing Andrew, still say, where is Andrew? Is this the convention? Is this how the conven conventional world Except, no, now you have already crossed the border of the conventional analysis. After crossing the border of the conventional analysis, you have gone into the ultimate analysis. You're getting it? After seeing Andrew, where are you? Your body is you. Your mind is you. This is not what the conventional world will do. You're getting it? When you go to the paths, paths as this the self, paths as the whole, this is what the conventional world will never do. You're getting it? So convention is how the world accepts things, things not into a deep analysis, into a, into a rough analysis, we, we call it. We call it more like unanalyzed, unanalyzed. Do, you don't go into the parts. Don't go into, don't go into the parts. Unanalyzed, meaning unanalyzed into the parts. The moment you go into the parts, the object will disappear, right? Okay, so I uh, say the analysis, conventional analysis and ultimate analysis. This one one way of putting it. You'll find the flower with, through which of the analysis? Conventional anal analysis or ultimate analysis? Conventional analysis. Now, keep this in mind. In some of the texts, you'll find a mention of unanalyzed and analyzed. So that is unanalyzed meaning Unanalyzed with respect to ultimate analysis. Analyzed meaning analyzed with respect to ultimate analysis. Now look, these are the technicalities they are being used. You have to know. One is conventional analysis and ultimate analysis. When you understand this, conventional analysis means how the ordinary people understand things. Ultimate analysis is when you go into the when you go into, when you go beyond the conventional analysis and the object disappears. Okay, when I say the flower, the flower disappears or not? When I say the flower, the flower disappears or, or you see the flower there. So that is conventional analysis. When you say that, oh, the atoms are the flower. So the moment you go into the atoms, the flower disappears. So that becomes ultimate analysis. And ultimate analysis may not necessarily be valid. It can be invalid analysis as well. Likewise, okay, okay, you're holding a chocolate. You're holding a chocolate in your hand, right? You're so keen on chocolate. Wherever you see, you see chocolates, right? So you see, the, oh, there's a chocolate in your hand. This is conventional analysis, ultimate analysis. Conventional analysis, but invalid conventional analysis, right? Invalid conventional analysis. Where, whereas I say that, oh, the atoms which constitute the flower, these atoms are the flower. Where's the, these atoms are the flower. This is invalid ultimate analysis. Where's the, oh, and, and the, when you go into atoms, the flower disappears. What is the analysis? Ultimate analysis, right? The valid ultimate analysis, very good. Okay, so now, another word, another word that we use, one of the labels that we use is analysis, analyzed, and unanalyzed. This is another term, which you don't mix this with the conventional analysis and ultimate analysis. Analyzed and unanalyzed. So, the conventional things here, the analyzed is a short form of analyzed, analyzed by ultimate analysis, unanalyzed by ultimate analysis. You don't forget it. And analyzed and unanalyzed. When you say this, okay, don't mix the two things. Analyzed and unanalyzed on the one hand. Conventional analysis and ultimate analysis on the other hand. Don't, don't mix the two things. These two are to be treated separately. So analyzed and unanalyzed with respect to what? 
with respect to ultimate analysis. You're getting it? Okay, so the flower exists flower exists only on the unanalyzed level, which means only on the level of the unanalyzed by the ultimate analysis. The flower exists, right? Flower exists, or in other words, everything, okay, let's see. Everything exists. Everything exists. Everything exists on the basis of the, the on the basis of the conventional analysis. Everything exists on the basis of the conventional analysis. You agree with me or not? Okay. Now look. Okay, see. Okay. Say, this flower, if you subject conventional analysis, you go to look for this object. I'm not saying the flower. When you go to look for the object, by using the conventional analysis, what will you find? Hey. <laughs> flower, very good. Okay. At one time, when I was in my, the, the, the first monastery, uh, my teacher, my teacher, Venerable Gishil of Sankyasula, the author of the two books which I suggested, and he is so bright, so bright. Okay. So, um, sometimes, oh, because of the, of, of course, the, the students, it's just a mixture. And then sometimes, at the, when he was teaching, sometimes he would ask questions. He would ask questions. And to make sure that everybody knows what is one, what is two, and sometimes to check whether they know 272, is, what, what is divided by five, what is the answer, right? Or sometimes, what exactly is 224? Someone very simple, sometimes very complicated. So. Sometimes he must be wondering whether the students they really understand it, anything. So he was to he was to make the question simpler, simpler, simpler. And sometimes the question becomes so simple. So some, oftentimes I I attempt to give I attempt to give the answers. And when the question is too simple, I even don't want to, to give the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to give the answer. The it's so simple, right? And then my teacher thought that no. They are just like very dull students. They don't even understand this. <laughs> so one time he scolded us terribly. If you don't understand, let me know that you don't understand. If you understand something, give answer. <laughs> if you don't understand, say I don't know. Right? Okay. So likewise. <laughs> okay, let's say the the flower. Maybe this question is too simple for you, so therefore you did not give the answer. Okay, okay. This object, when you subject it to ultimate conversion analysis, what do you find? You find good, very good. <laughs> you you find a flower. Okay. Now we subject this to ultimate analysis. What do you find? The flower disappears. You discover that the flower is not findable. The absence of the flower, the emptiness of the flower. Okay, tell me. When you subject this object to the ultimate analysis, what will you find? You'll find the emptiness of the flower. What do you mean by emptiness of the flower? By employing, there are two things involved. One is the object, one is the analysis. What kind of analysis? Ultimate analysis. With the ultimate analysis, then the object is seen as emptiness of the flower. The flower disappears, in other words. The flower disappears. It's just atoms. The flower disappears. When you subject the same object to the conventional analysis, what do you find? You find the flower. You're getting, okay, now tell me, group A, group B. Group A, uh, group A uses the conventional analysis. Conventional analysis. In other words, your eyes are conventional analysis. And group B, your eyes are ultimate analysis. Okay. Now, this object, I'm holding this object. I'm not touching this. I'll keep this here. I'm not even touching it. Let, let, let us not alter the object. So this object, group A, with your eyes of conversion analysis, what do you see? Flower. Group B, with your ultimate analysis, what do you see? Emptiness of flower. What do you mean by emptiness of flower? There's no flower there. You're so surprised. They're seeing flower. There's no flower there. From your, from your eyesight, with your eyesight, you don't see any flower there. It's empty. Emptiness of the flower. You're getting it? Okay. With this, same. What we have, what we have, I, 
I am a male, I am a female, that is on the basis of the body, aggregate of the body, aggregate of the form, right? So, when you look at the, the physical form, your own physical form, then group A with your conventional analysis, with your eyesight of the conventional analysis, when you look at the physical, physical form, what do you see? Physical form. You see this object as a physical form. Group B with your ultimate analysis, your eyesight of the ultimate analysis, what do you see? Emptiness of the form. Are you looking at the same object or two different objects? Same object, right? Now, say the, the flower that group A is seeing, the emptiness of the flower that group B is seeing, are these two one entity or two different entities? Hey, group, what group A is seeing the flower, what group B is seeing the emptiness of the flower, are these two one entity or two entities? Two entities, one entities, okay. How many of you say one entity? Okay, how many of you say two entities? Two hundred raise your hands. Okay, so let's say uh, these two, are, uh, let's say, say, um, where are you seeing the form? It's here, yes, no? Group A will say yes. Hey, Group B, where are you seeing the emptiness of form? Is here? Yes, no? Okay, now I'm not going to lift my finger. I'm going to keep the finger there, right? I'm not going to lift the finger towards the object. Uh, group A, is this the flower? Group B, is this the emptiness of flower? Both of you say yes, which means I'm pointing to the same object for the referent of the two labels, which means when you go to the same object for the referent of two labels, these two are the entity-wise the same. Entity-wise meaning towards the object. From the object, these two are just the same. We can point to the same object. But in your mind, in your mind, these two appear as different or these two appear as same? Huh? No, these two are just the same. These two appear as different? Huh? Don't trust my face. <laughs> Be confident, be confident. Okay, these two appear same or different? How different? You raise your hand, anyone. How different? Very quick. Yes, over there? Um, how, how? You are right, the answer is correct. How you see as different, anyone? Yes, yes. Uh, yes, you could see the one's physical form. Okay, the characteristics are different, and the one is form, and one is emptiness form. Yes, anyone else who likes to add to this? This good answer, anyone else? Anyone? Yes, over there? Huh? Okay, what I'm saying is... Atoms are not the form. Okay, now you just say, uh, okay. One is seeing the emptiness of the, we're not talking about the atoms, we're talking about the emptiness of the form, right? Emptiness of the form, group A sees it as a form, group B sees it as emptiness of the form. So what is the difference between two? I'm not talking about the atoms, I'm talking about the form and the emptiness of the form. If difference in the form, I'm not talking about the difference in general. Difference how isolated wise, when you think, on the object, do you see that it's just the same? On the subject, what's the difference? Anyone else? Yes, we can. For one, there, there seems to be something there that you can, uh, you, there seems to be something there that you can see. For the second thing, it's just an absence. Okay. In other words, what we can is, we can is saying is that group A, what they are seeing is a positive phenomena. You've learned it? Oh no, I'm sorry. So this we learned last year. You learned, not learn. Positive, negative phenomena. Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Oh, okay, then that's good. Okay, let's say, so the group A, what the group A is seeing is a positive phenomena, right? What the group B is seeing is a negative phenomena. Positive phenomena and negative phenomena, these two are mutually exclusive. Right? How you see the two things? Actually, it's the same object, but it is perceived in two different ways. Perceived subjectively 
The same object is perceived in two ways. One sees this as a positive phenomena, and other sees this as a negative phenomena. You're getting it? And the positive phenomena and negative phenomena, these two are mutually exclusive, which means a positive phenomena cannot be negative, negative cannot be positive. You're getting it? So these two are mutually exclusive. So because these two are mutually exclusive in your mind, isolated wise, these two are different. Entity wise, these two are same. You're getting it? Very good. Okay. Now, so tell me, what is this object? Is this the form or this emptiness of the form? Or is this the flower or this emptiness of the flower? Tell me. Huh? What is this object? Huh? Okay, <laughs> don't be hesitant. Tell me, hey, group A, what is this object? Form. What is the flower? Group B, what is this? And the flower. So both are correct. How can we say that both are correct? Well, these two are mutually exclusive with respect to one being positive, one being negative. How can both be correct? Both be correct only if you consider the conventional or the subjective, the subjective, the existence. From the object, if it exists from the object, it cannot be positive as well as negative. Only with subject, then you see that one can be positive, one is negative. You're getting it? So subjectively it is true, objectively it is nothing here. You're getting it? Okay. Now let us see. This is this would be a very helpful anal the analogy. Let us say, okay, let us say there are two X-rays. Let us say there are two X-rays. Two X-rays. And what is the X-ray for? X-rays are two. Check what is inside, right? Okay, one is the X-ray of the ultimate analysis, and the other is the X-ray of the conventional analysis, right? Okay, same. They are owning the X-ray of the conventional analysis, and you owning the X-ray of the ultimate analysis. Now I'm going to put this flower in the X-ray. X-ray of the conventional analysis. What will come out of this uh, when you put something from the bag? You know, when you put your bag in the X-ray, where where does it come from? First it goes into the x-ray, then where does it come from? From the other side, right? Okay, when you put this flower in the x-ray of the conventional analysis, when you put there, from the other side, what will come out? Flower will come out. You're getting it? Okay, when you, your x-ray is very special. Your x-ray, when I put this flower there, from the other end, what will come out? Emptiness of flower will come out. You're getting it? What comes out is very different. So why? Because of the difference in the x-rays. Because of the difference in the analysis. You're getting it? Now, look, this is very important. This is very important. Analysis which you employ, what is that known as? Conventional analysis. Analysis that you employ, what is that known as? Ultimate analysis. So just by the label, one is conventional, one is ultimate, what comes out from your analysis, from your x-ray, is known as ultimate you know, conventional truth. Because your analysis is conventional analysis. And what comes out of your x-ray, that is not what you put in, what comes out. That is the ultimate truth. Because your analysis is ultimate analysis. Hey, it seems like you are really in the ultimate analysis. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing is coming out of it, right? <laughs> or tell me, what is your analysis? Conventional analysis or ultimate analysis? ultimate analysis. So therefore, what comes out as a result, that should be the ultimate truth or the conventional truth? Ultimate truth. What comes out of your x-ray, that should be conventional truth or ultimate truth? Conventional truth. Don't forget. Now I'm going to say, Acharya Chandrakirti, he taught, he taught the two truths. Two truths with respect to all phenomena. Every phenomena has the ultimate truth and the conventional truth. You're getting it? Every phenomena. Don't forget. So, how can we know this? So, the same object has two truths. How? This same object, you send it to the external the conventional truth, conventional analysis. What will come out? The flower will come out. Okay, tell me, what is the... So, whatever comes out of the first x-ray is known as conventional truth of the flower. Whatever comes out of the second x-ray is the ultimate truth of the flower. Tell me. Uh, so, what is the conventional truth of this flower? What is the conventional truth of this flower? Flower. How? Because the flower is the one that comes out of this, comes out as a result of the conventional analysis. When you put this into the x-ray, 
first X-ray of the ultimate conventional analysis, what will come out there? The flower will come out, right? Now, what is the ultimate truth of this flower? What is the ultimate truth of this flower? Particularly this group, hey. Empty the flower, what makes you think that? Because when you put the same object, the flower, into this X-ray of the ultimate analysis, what will come out? Absence of objectivity of the flower or the emptiness of flower comes out. So whatever comes out, that is the ultimate truth of this flower. You're getting it? Okay, now tell me, how many of you agree with Acharya Chandrakirti? That every phenomena has two, two truths. How many of you agree with him? Don't follow him blindly, right? Yes, of course, he's a great saint. <laughs> great saint, a great practicing, great, great scholarly saint, not just a saint, but a great, great scholar, right? Top-notch scholar. Top-notch scholar. Everything has two, two truths. Truth. Everything has two truths. Two truths, 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 two truths. Everything, right? Okay. Now, with this, how many of you can envision? Don't just speck him. Don't just, you know, roughly follow him blindly. Don't just blindly follow him, right? Okay. Just sit and imagine we are back in 7th century AD when Acharya Chandrakirti was giving teachings and Acharya Chandragomi was standing there. Right? You know the story? Huh? I did not share this here? Did I share this? Oh, we've forgotten that. No. Okay. So Acharya Chandrakirti was giving teaching on and so on emptiness, right? Okay. Then you are, you are just sitting there and Acharya Chandrakirti says, Every phenomena has two truths. Every phenomena has two truths. Okay, how many of you, okay, how many years now after Acharya Chandra 1000? Like 300 years. Okay, so you remember what you learned from 1300s later in Jambi, right? In Jambi, you remember that three clever ones in the future? Right? In the future, oh, Acharya Chandragriti, uh, what you said is correct. Or some of you, okay, I, I'm going to learn it way, way, way later, so I can't really, that's not so clear in my mind. So I cannot blindly follow you. So let me just give me, a, let me give a thought to this. Okay, how many of you say that, yes, what Acharya Chandragriti, what you said is correct? Just raise hands. Okay, how many of you say that, give me time, I'll think about it later. Good. Okay. Let's see. Those who said that what I said is correct. Okay. Um, let me ask this question. Say, what is ultimate truth of this flower? Hey, group B. <laughs> what is the ultimate truth of this flower? <laughs> Emptiness of the flower. Okay. Emptiness of the flower. Is it a phenomena or not? Emptiness of the flower. Does it exist or not? Hey, group B. Ultim say emptiness of the flower, does it exist or not? Does it exist or not? This is my question. Hey, don't be afraid. Uh, or these two questions may be too simple. <laughs> right? Okay, it exists. It does exist. If it does exist, it should be a phenomena. Existence, existent. And phenomena, these two are synonymous. So, the emptiness of a flower, it, if it does exist, it should be a phenomena. If it is a phenomena, it should have two truths. Okay, tell me. Ultimate truth of this flower. What is the conventional truth of this flower? What is the conventional truth of the ultimate truth of the flower? Ultimate truth of the flower, let's say now, say, conventional truth, and the ultimate truth. Say this is the ultimate truth of the flower. What is the ultimate truth of the flower? Emptiness of the emptiness of flower. Okay, emptiness of the flower as the ultimate truth. If this is a phenomenon, this should have two truths, right? Ultimate truth of the flower should have also have two truths. Okay. Ultimate truth of the flower, what is the conventional truth of this ultimate truth of the flower? Huh? 
Anderson flower is the ultimate truth. It's not conventional truth. Huh? The, uh, say it again. The label. The label is word. Word is not. Uh, the word is not the ultimate truth. Conventional truth. So the flower, conventional truth of flower should be the flower. Right? So convention, the, if there's conventional truth of the ultimate truth of the flower, then it should be the ultimate truth of the flower. Ultimate truth of the flower cannot be a word. It should be a... Of course, if, even word is also a phenomena. Ultimate truth of the flower should be a negative phenomena. Sound, the word, is a positive phenomena. Right? Okay. Tell me, ultimate truth of the flower, does it have two truths? Yes, no. What is the, what is the conventional truth of the ultimate truth of the flower? And Zohi, say it again. Of the flower is the of the okay. Very good. Okay, let's say that this is the ultimate truth of the flower. Let's say this is the ultimate truth of the flower, right? So the conventional truth of the conventional truth of the ultimate truth of the flower is. The emptiness of the flower. Emptiness of the flower is the conventional truth of the ultimate truth of the flower. Then what is the ultimate truth of the ultimate truth of the flower? Okay, what is the ultimate truth of the ultimate truth of the flower then? Emptiness of the emptiness of a flower. Very good. Okay. How many of you are happy with this? Or how many of you are, okay, it becomes a little hazy. Raise your hands uh, who think that it becomes a little hazy. Okay, don't worry. Now it's very simple. Imagine that this, imagine, imagine that this is the ultimate truth. Imagine that this is the ultimate truth of the flower. Imagine that this is the ultimate truth of the flower. Now the flower, uh, don't forget what we learn? What we learn? Every phenomena has two truths. Every phenomena has two truths, with no exception to anything. Don't forget it, right? If that is the case, the question arises: What is the same? If ultimate truth or the emptiness of the flower does it also does it also have two truths? Emptiness of flower is a phenomena. Emptiness of flower. Does it, does it also have two truths? The answer is yes. So, what is the ultimate truth of the emptiness of flower? What is the conventional truth of the emptiness of flower? It's very simple. It's very simple, right? Okay, particularly those people, those of you who felt that it's a little hazy, don't worry, it's very simple. Okay, imagine that this is the, imagine that this is the, imagine that this is the, what? This is a, okay, you don't really imagine this is a flower. Okay, this flower, just see what is the ultimate truth of this object. What is the ultimate truth of this object? What do you do? No, what is the conventional truth of this object? What do you do? You send it in this x-ray, x-ray A. If, if you want to know what is the ultimate truth of this, this flower, you send it through the x-ray B and look at the outcome, right? Okay, what is the conventional truth of this flower? You send it through which x-ray? X-ray A, you actually send x-ray through, what comes out of that? Flower comes out. So what is the ult what is the conventional truth of this object? Flower. Very good. Now what is the ultimate truth of this object? How do you, which x-ray will you send this? X-ray B. By sending this through the x-ray B, what will come out of that? Emptiness of flower. So what is the ultimate truth of this flower? Emptiness of the flower. Very good. Now let's send the, let's see the, you want to know what is the conventional truth and the ultimate truth of the Emptiness of the flower. Now, instead of seeing, sending the flower, send the emptiness of the flower. Send the emptiness of the flower through X-ray. What do you want to know? No, what do you want to know? Don't be too fast. <laughs> okay, you want to know the conventional truth of the emptiness of the flower. So if you want to know the conventional truth of X the emptiness of the flower, where should this emptiness of the flower be sent? Which of the X-ray? X-ray A. By sending emptiness of the flower through the X-ray A, what will come out? Emptiness of flower comes out. Tell me, what is the conventional truth of this, the emptiness of flower? Emptiness. emptiness of flower. Whatever comes out, there's the conventional truth of the emptiness of flower. Now, what do you want to know? Second. What do you know? You know the 
ultimate truth of the emptiness of the flower. If you want to know this, which of the two extremes you, you have to send this object from? From P. By sending the emptiness of the flower in the extreme 2, what will come out? Then emptiness of the emptiness will come out. Emptiness of the flower will not come out. Emptiness of the emptiness will come out. So now tell me, whatever comes out from this X-ray is the ultimate truth of the object which you send through the air. What did you send? Emptiness of the flower. And what came out? Emptiness of the emptiness of the flower came out. So what is the ultimate truth of this emptiness of the flower? Emptiness of the emptiness of the flower is the ultimate truth of the emptiness of the flower. You're getting it? So you will never end. Of course. So, <laughs> yes. Now, say, when will that then end? As long as you keep putting in this x ray, right? <laughs> Emptiness of that object will always come out, right? So, therefore, they, if there is an end, it's very dangerous. If the machine gets stuck, then you will never find the ultimate truth of that object. Right? Mission should not stuck. It should keep on going. It should keep on going at infinitum, infinitely. Right? So, because of which every phenomena has two truths. This is the meaning. Right? Okay. Yes. Vishala, so I'm uh, just wondering, uh, I fully understand um, the, the way of thinking that we derive emptiness of emptiness of a flower. I'm just wondering, in terms, when we really meditate, what is the, what's the real meaning? Because emptiness of flower means you can't find the objective existence of a flower. So that's emptiness of flower. So when we talk about emptiness of emptiness of flower, what does it really mean? Very good question. Okay. okay. So in practical terms, in practical terms, in your meditation, Okay, emptiness of flower, it means something. That the objective existence of the flower dissolves. Right? Now in the meditation, what, what sense does it make to say the emptiness of the emptiness of the flower? This question, right? Okay, very good question. So there, the tendency, the Buddha taught the 16 divisions of emptiness. Buddha taught the 16 divisions of emptiness. Okay, um, say um, some of them, some of the, the some amongst the 16 divisions are, for example, the great emptiness. One of which is known as the great emptiness. Great emptiness means is the emptiness. Emptiness is described as in great. Emptiness is described as great. Why great? Because emptiness pervades all phenomena. So therefore it is great, right? Now emptiness of the great meaning, emptiness of emptiness, which is great, right? So the same, when you say emptiness of great, we tend to objectify the greatness of the emptiness. We tend to objectify the greatness of them. The moment, the moment you, you say, wow, <laughs> when you say, the moment you say, wow, when, when the moment you say, wow, you're already objectifying something, right? Say, when you really see the emptiness of object, wow, there will not come. A very serene experience will come. Very serene because the object disappears and that experience is so profound that, wow, this is a very different. Wow, it means objectification. Instead, Instead of wow, a very serene experience. If somebody is to take the photograph or the video photograph of the person just going deep in this case, even the, the facial expression would be very different. Would be very different, right? Okay, okay. If somebody is really going to too deep into emptiness, then you might see as though like the person's whole facial expression really absorbed whole expression, maybe like someone who is in a deep sleep, but don't want to do sleep, right? And then you, okay, the thing is that when you are really, there, there's a the alertness there, freshness there, freshness there, but the, it's a sort of like the person's deep, into, to, with such a deep sleep, or like in a coma state, right? Because physiologically, it's affected. Physiologically, everything, is tempered, 
is everything so everything is becoming so smooth and becomes so tranquil and serene. The turbulence stops. So physiologically, you will, even the physical expression. And then inside the practitioner, physiologically, the tremendous experience comes to the individual. Right? Okay. So the the thing is that when you see the emptiness, perhaps when you see the, the glimpse of them. So this is why yesterday I was talking about the mixture, right? So you say, what is the rises? No, no, then white, you become white, all the black dissolved. No. When you go towards the white, it is not still fully white, it's gate, gate, para gate. When you realize emptiness, or when you get a glimpse of emptiness for the first time, not stable experience. You may realize it, but not stable, right? Instantly, instantly, um, say, the feeling of the amazement, wow, that comes, already you objectify the emptiness. Already you objectify the emptiness, right? So, now, some people may get stuck to this. Wow. Empty, the objective, objectification of the emptiness. Objectification of the greatness of the emptiness. So you make it stuck there. So the Buddha said that even that is poison. Seeing the emptiness as objectively real, even that is poison. You have to see the emptiness of the emptiness. Right? Objectification dissolved. Okay. So now, in practical terms, to see the emptiness of the emptiness, when will it happen? This is the question. So, the, the best thing is, best thing is, first we have to know all these things, that everything has two truths, including the emptiness, including emptiness. The next, the next thing is, take this journey, undertake this journey to see the emptiness of self, to see the emptiness of the, say the emptiness of the, say the flower, to see the emptiness of the object, which is so repulsive, which is of repulsion, which is very, um, which makes you put off, which gives you anger, and so forth. And to see the so emptiness of the, the emptiness of the object, interaction with which triggers emotions, negative emotions, and that's like attachment, anger, jealousy, and so forth, right? Okay, one. Now, the emptiness of the emptiness means what is the object of analysis? Say, emptiness of the flower. The emptiness becomes the characteristic and the flower becomes the characterized. So, the object of analysis is the characterized. The flower becomes the object of analysis. Object of analysis. On this basis, when you see that it, it doesn't exist objectively, then you find the emptiness of the flower. Right? So, now, when we say the emptiness of the emptiness, what is the object of analysis? Emptiness itself becomes object analysis, then we see the emptiness of the emptiness. Emptiness of the mind, what is the object of analysis? The mind becomes object of analysis, the mind. The mind is very subtle. The mind is very subtle to find, to see this mind is so subtle. So because of which, to meditate on the emptiness of the mind, it is not that easy. Because the object itself is very subtle. And first we don't get the object, and then emptiness is even more subtle. And those two subtle things, Mix up and then you don't you don't get anything, you get lost. Right? So therefore the emptiness of the emptiness. The first one is the object analysis that should be emptiness already. And the second one is the, the again the additional emptiness. So for this, the the to actually get the emptiness, one need to have some experience of emptiness. Only then you see how one tends to objectify. Even when, even when you see the emptiness, say for example, we have the tendency that any object that you encounter with, you tend to objectify that, including emptiness. Right? So for that, we have to first get the object. What is the object? Emptiness. First you have to get the emptiness. Only when you get it, then you can objectify it. How many of you objectify emptiness? Huh? Okay, so somebody who, obje who objectifies emptiness means somebody has some little experience of emptiness. Right? Without getting the object, how can you objectify that? Or how many of you are, how many of you are, say, uh, say, thousand billion dollars is in Swiss bank? Or thousand billion dollars is operating in Google? In, uh, what, no, Google, what do you call it? No, the, the, what is that? No, the, what? The Apple company? Okay, let's see. How many of you, the 100,000 billion dollars 
is operating in the operating in the in the stocks operating in the stocks and somebody is misbehaving with this money how many of your money has this problem somebody is misbehaving you have, you have said about that to for to see that somebody is misbehaving with your money that money should be there hundred thousand billion dollars should be there we don't have it so we don't have to worry about any person misbehaving with that <laughs> likewise when you don't get the emptiness in the first place, you don't have to worry about the emptiness, objectification of the emptiness. Because we don't have the emptiness in the first place, right? Okay, don't worry about that. Okay, only when you get emptiness, only when you get emptiness, then um, you will see, you, you just observe yourself, and then it is you who should be doing it. Because you already know what emptiness is. You already know how to analyze emptiness. You already know what is the what is the objectification of emptiness? What is the objectification of something? Right? And then you get a glimpse of emptiness and then see how you objectify this. Right? Okay. So on that basis you will get what is known as emptiness of emptiness. Okay. Now the next, I think um, the... Okay. So... Um, Now, this is very important, okay. With this emptiness of experience, oftentimes, uh, people tend to have, okay, people tend to have a misunderstanding, right? People tend to have misunderstanding, and because of which, um, there is a warning given, warning given, in the various standard texts that some people some people have the misunder the misunderstanding or the say misknowledge wrong information about about things to be permanent things to be permanent things to be objective existence things to be permanent and by the way don't uh, keep in mind that Things as permanent and things as the things as objectively existent. These two are not the same. Don't forget it. There's a stark contrast between the two. Seeing the flower as permanent, seeing the flower as objectively existent. Seeing the self as permanent, seeing the self as objectively existent. Oftentimes, people equate the two. This is not true. There's a stark contrast between the two. Right? What is emptiness? Oh, emptiness is so popular in Buddhism. What is emptiness? Oh, it's impermanence. Many people explain like this. Many people explain like this. If you do find someone explaining like this, and don't fight against this person, but at least from your side you have to know that these two are not the same. Right? Right? So, even some books, some popular books, so this is why I'm always warning when you read books, particularly uh, when you're at the phase of learning. When you're at the phase of learning, the books must be very authentic books. Don't just grab any other books, any books. Grab the authentic books. Once you have these authentic books on the basis of which your understanding becomes very authoritative, then you can read any books. You will know which is the correct book, which is the wrong book on your own. Whereas oftentimes, we are dyeing the cloth. We are dyeing the very fresh white cloth, and you first dye with the dull cloth, don't dye, dye color, don't expect to have a beautiful color next time. So this basic, the first dyeing of the, the cloth, very dull, so that will always be there. So therefore, with the books, particularly for emptiness, Bodhijal, I'm not too worried. Particularly for emptiness, make sure that you read the very authoritative books initially, and then later on, once you get some authority on emptiness, once you get some command of emptiness, uh, okay, once you exactly know where you should be going, what exactly is emptiness, then you can read any book, it doesn't matter, right? For example, this is what Buddha Shakyamuni, in fact, advised uh, his followers. So it, the Buddha said that for the ordinary people, the Buddha advised not to, not to read, not to read, the, the scriptures, not to read the scriptures, um, scriptures which would have a bad influence in us, bad influence in us, right? For example, animal sacrifice, 
script scriptures on animal sacrifice written by other the um, the other the, the what the people or the other teachers animal sacrifice and so forth. I'm not going to give, go into detail. So the Buddha said, initially don't read that the just any scripture so that will have a very bad influence on you whereas then some people may think that oh the buddha may be a little bias right a little bias and he's trying to stop us from following other traditions so forth then the buddha made, made the second statement if your intelligence is as good as shariputra then you can read any material Meaning that there's no danger. Because you know what is what, what is what, what wrong is wrong, what right is right. You know that. So on that basis there's no danger. So this is the qualification with the, which the Buddha made when he warned the people not to read the materials which can have a very bad influence in your mind stream. Likewise for emptiness, for bodhicitta is easy because for bodhicitta you read any material you may, if you don't have the information you get a good information you go wow this is amazing right and then you see something else which is not as uh, the effective okay this is so so you will be in a position to judge what is what what is not what whereas with emptiness because that this is the first journey we are undertaking and the subject is very complicated and then the, the books, they have a tremendous effect on the mind, influence on the mind. So initially always read the authority of the books. Don't read, for example, books which say that what is emptiness? It is impermanence. Don't read those books. Don't read those books for the time being. Later on, when you know exactly know what is emptiness, then you can read any book. And then you can easily say, oh, this book is not as good. This book is very good. This book is, okay, so-so. You can make a distinction. Right? Initially read the authority, the very authentic books. Okay, one, so now in this regard, in this regard, um, say the two truths. When you speak of the two truths, what is the two truths? What are the two truths? Conventional truth and the ultimate truth. You're getting it? Okay. Now, if you could remember what we discussed right from the beginning, the dependent origination and the emptiness as the two sides of the same coin. Okay, don't take it too literal. That the, the, the same side of the two coin, for example, say this is a coin, this is a coin, then, then this atom and this atom, these two are not identical, this atom, this atom, don't go into this fuss. Right? It's just to, it's a very simple analogy given. Once you understand the analogy, that's good enough. Don't take it too literally, right? If you take too literally, then everything will dissolve. Where's the table? It's in front of you. Which one? Top line, double line. The, the table will disappear. Then you will have nothing. Then you can't even eat food. Then the food will disappear. Right? <laughs> yeah. So therefore, when the examples are given, when the examples are given, these examples are meant to give you, to help you to gain insight into a deeper meaning. So the examples, you don't take them too literally. So when it says the two sides of the same coin, it simply means it is simply an expression. It's simply an expression which is not in the Tibetan tradition which is not in the, in the classical, the Sanskrit tradition, which is not in the classical Buddhist tradition. It is an English expression, two sides of the same. It's a very beautiful expression, and it can be used in, or it is more like the two, it is like the, the two isolates of the same entity, right? So when you say two isolates of the same entity, the newcomers will be bored. When you say, where is it? these are the two sides of the same coin, it's so appealing, it's so enticing, right? right? So therefore, say the dependent origination and emptiness, what we learned from the beginning is that these two are the two sides of the same coin. Now, what we're learning is that the two truths, okay, don't forget, earlier we speak about the emptiness and dependent origination as the two sides of the same coin. Now we are pairing, we are pairing, Conventional truth and the ultimate truth, right? Okay, so slowly we'll see that they all come to the same point. They are, all will come to the same point. What did we learn in the beginning? What did we learn in the beginning? Emptiness and dependent origination are the two sides of the same coin. And how did we deduce this? How did we deduce emptiness and dependent origination as the two sides of the same coin? How? Oh, 
Okay, somebody's busy with the flipping the, the pieces. <laughs> Something's coming to the mind, but not too clear flipping. And then somebody's saying five, five. What is five, five? I'm not. <laughs> so what? How did we deduce the emptiness and dependent origination as the two sides of the same coin? Lucky that it's just lucky that it's just few days. <laughs> if it is, if it is like already one year, one year program. And then you don't have these five, or uh, say uh, on your fingertips, then you will be fired, <laughs> right? Lucky, because in such a short span of time, how can we are already exhausted? We are already exhausted. We thought that this is a retreat. Retreat means go away from the busy schedule. It becomes even more busy, <laughs> even more intense, right? So yesterday we started at four o'clock, four a.m., and then ended up in ten, right? <laughs> so tired, <laughs> right? It's not a tweet actually, it's more intense. Okay, so you're exempted, no problem, right? By the way, if you remember, tell me, how did we deduce emptiness and dependent origination as the two sides of the same coin? Okay, so he is. Yes. Emptiness is emptiness of independent existence. Very good. And then from there we deduce that emptiness is also empty of objective existence. Yes. And then how do we get <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay, <laughs> never mind, never mind. Yeah. Wow, you, so, yeah. so it's lack of dependent, it's, it's, it's therefore <laughs> yes, dependently yes. Ori uh, uh, existing. Yes. And therefore it's dependent origination. So yeah, okay, yeah, skip so he don't look at me. Don't look at me. Right? You have to look at the face of other people. Imagine that others are newcomers. He in Zohi, imagine that others are newcomers. And just you have to look at their face. And if their face looks so blank, which means something is wrong. <laughs> if they look so exciting, which means you are getting somewhere. Okay, we shall. <laughs> emptiness is, means uh, emptiness of independent existence. Emptiness is a short form of well, emptiness of objective ex independent existence. And which means that nothing is independently existent. Okay, uh, emptiness of independent existence means nothing exists independently. Nothing exists independently, which means everything exists dependently. Still number four. Yes. Number four, <laughs> you have to say like this, number one. Number four. <laughs> number two, number three, then people will glow. If you say connected links, they will not see the demarcation. Okay. Right? So, Number nothing three exists. Is nothing exists independently. Everything, okay. Nothing exists independently. This is number three. What number is number four? Everything exists dependently. N nothing exists independently means number four. Everything exists dependently. Number four. Number five. Therefore, everything is dependently. Therefore, originated. everything is dependently existent, or dependently originated. Therefore, everything is dependently originated, dependent origination, right? Okay. So, from this deduction, we see that emptiness equals dependent origination. Yet, equals meaning these two are entity wise same, not isolated wise same. Emptiness and dependent origination, how many of you will say isolated wise, entity wise same? Emptiness and dependent origination are entity wise same. Raise your hands. <laughs> emptiness and dependent origination. Entity wise different. Okay. Emptiness dependent origin entity wise are uh, not too sure. Okay. Emptiness and independent existence. Um, no, emptiness and dependent origination are isolate wise same. Isolate wise same. Okay. Emptiness and dependent origination <laughs> isolate wise same. Huh? Emptiness dependent origination, absolute wise different. Very good. Okay, tell me, how do you defend it? How would you say that emptiness and dependent origination, these two are just give me any clue, which we, any clue by which I cannot reject you, right? By which I cannot reject you. Tell me, emptiness and dependent origination, these two are entity wise same, but absolute wise different. How these two are absolute wise different? Any good clue? Anyone? Yes or a yes here? Yen? One is Very good. Now, if you say like this, I cannot.
provoke you. Right? There's nothing left for me to provoke you. Emptiness is a negative phenomena, and dependent origination is a positive phenomena. De positive phenomena and negative phenomena are two mutually exclusive phenomena. So therefore, emptiness and dependent origination cannot be isolated by the same. These two are isolated by different. Very good. Very good. Okay. Now, on the one hand, earlier we learned about the emptiness and dependent origination. Now we are learning about the two thirds. Two thirds. We getting it? Two thirds. What are the two thirds? Conventional truth and ultimate truth. Now tell me, conventional truth and ultimate truth, are these two entities why is one or different? Hey, conventional truth and ultimate truth, entity was one or different? Huh? Conventional truth and ultimate truth, entity was one or different? Okay, emptiness and dependent origin is isolated why is one or different? Huh? No, emptiness and no, ultimate truth, conventional truth. Okay. <laughs> Because you are almost sleeping, I'm also sleeping. <laughs> okay, um, the conventional truth and ultimate truth, entity was one or different? Okay, tell me. How the conventional truth and ultimate truth, these two are entity was one? Okay, those of us, right? I understand it. Do you know how the, the computer 10 years ago, were, how the computers 10 years ago, 20 years ago, they work, you know, how the computers work? It's amazing, right? My hand was pretty quick, pretty fast in typing. Because I started to learn this, I think many of the, the, the younger ones were not born, right? I started to, to type when the typewriter was not as common. And the computer was just almost like in the more remote places, new introduced and many places it was even not introduced. I already started doing that and my fingers were quite fast. And then the ant in the monastery, the first monastery, the, in, the Institute of Buddhist Dialectics, Singing Lopta, so there I started with this, with some editorial work. Then for the second monastery, there, then I came there, they started to buy a new computer. New computer means like 20 years ago. Okay, so but we paid a lot. Okay, so this computer, and then, and the fingers were so fast, right? And I say for example, how are you? How, A, my finger all finished. A, R, space, Y, I thought then, okay, now it's got stuck. And then I erase everything, right? Still keep going. Why? <laughs> oh, I erase everything already, <laughs> but it's still working. Oh, it's not listening to me, listening to my command, you. Okay, fine, very good. Okay, now it's sentence complete. Okay, where are you now, right? When I say, where are you now, it's finished. And it erase everything back. <laughs> <laughs> it is everything. So I can't work at all on this computer. And that is, even that is good because at least it's working. Whether it's not working, it's working with my fingers, without the, the out of my fingers, it's up to them, out of the computer, right? At least it was working. Sometimes what happened, and the computer gets stuck. And I thought that is going to operate in, after two minutes, I wait two minutes. And it remains like this static. <laughs> the computer hanged because the command is so fast. Command is so fast, and the, the, the hardware cannot operate so fast as the software, right? <laughs> so likewise, what is happening here is in such a short span of time, so much information, and then the computer get hanged. <laughs> computer get hanged. <laughs> the two toads, right? One entity, different entity. You have all learned it, and you get stuck. <laughs> right? Okay, so tell me. Tell me, don't worry, slow down. <laughs> okay, say the two truths. Ultimate truth and conventional truth. Entity was one and different. 
<laughs> okay, don't do like, you know, I'm writing the second word and first one's still coming. I'm erasing the first, I erase the first one and third one's still, still coming, right? Okay, the two truths. Convention truth, ultimate truth. Entity was one or different. Okay, so none of the different means the computer is going backwards. He learned it already many times and still is going backward. Okay, the two entity, the, <laughs> the two truths, the two truths, okay, tell me whether they are same entity or different entities? Same entity. Now tell me, what makes you think that the two truths, conventional truth, the ultimate truth, these two are same entity? What makes you think? Quick, anyone? Yes? Because every phenomenon, phenomenon has two truths. Because every phenomenon, oh, this is a wonderful way of presentation. Because every phenomena has two truths. Okay, so what is the, the purpose of asking this question? What, what, what was the question that, what was the answer that man gave? Every phenomenon has two truths. This answer that was given to us. And what is the question to which this answer was given? What is the question? Anyone? How do you know that conventional truth and ultimate truth are the entity wise the same? Uh, exactly, one? exactly. Now, this is a wonderful answer given. This is a wonderful answer given. But the answer is so brilliant. Answer so brilliant. Answer and the question in between, there is a very thin layer, thin layer or a thin sheet which the people and this side listening to the questions may not be able to see the other side, right? The answer given is so good, but between the answer and the question, it is not so transparent. There is one very thin layer which obstructs us to see what the answer is or anyone. Okay, first tell me, what is the question? Conventional truth and the ultimate truth, how are these two? The entity why is the same. This question. And what is the answer given by Man? That every phenomena has two truths. Okay, this answer given. Is there anyone who likes to remove this veil in between? Saying that the answer given by Man is perfectly correct. It's a very precise answer. Right? It's a very precise answer uh, to this question. Anyone? Raise your hands. Okay, um, the Chen Chen. When you point to any phenomena, you will see two truths. You have to point to any. When you point to the same object, same object meaning the same meaning, no, you are not pointing to two different objects. You are pointing to the same object. That itself, you will see the two truths meaning, if there are two things coming out of that the same object, these two are the same entity because we point to the same object. So every phenomena has two truths means. Automatically, what you are saying is that the two truths are of the same nature, same entity wise, the same. Very good. Okay, thank you. Now, um, tell me. On one hand, we have what? Emptiness and dependent origination. On the other hand, we have ultimate truth and the conventional truth. You are getting it? Okay. Are these two, di two different sets or these two are? much more the same. For example, let's say the boys and girls, two set, a set of two, a set of two boys and girls, right? And they, they say the vegetables and the fruits, vegetables and fruits, they are again different. Again, a set of two, right? Set of two. Boys and girls, again, set of two. Are these two somehow we can correlate or these are totally different sets? Huh? Boys and girls on the one hand, and vegetables and fruits. Huh? Two different, totally unrelated sets or something that can be correlated. The fruits are more the boys, or the vegetables are more the girls, or the fruits are more the girls, or the vegetables are the, something can be correlated or totally unrelated. Totally unrelated. Is this the case with the emptiness and dependent origination on the one hand, and ultimate truth and the convention truth on the other hand, are these two total unrelated sets or these two are related sets? Very related. How these two are very related? Anyone? Yes. Very good. Okay. Now this is also a brilliant answer. Again, there's a veil there. 
very brilliant answer. We have to lift the veil. Anyone who can explain this, what the Li Hui said, is a very good answer. One is seen from subject, and the other one is okay. Okay, seen from the okay, seen from the object. I'm not sure, but uh, subject meaning more conventional, and the other one is the ultimate, right? Ultimate. Okay, let's say the now we can say that we can correlate the two on the basis of the understanding of the perception. The perception, right? On the perception, say the convent, say the emptiness and dependent origination. Dependent origination is the perception taking place, perception taking place on the conventional level, may more from the subjective or the conventional level, right? Dependent origination. And emptiness is the emptiness is on the ultimate level. Now the two truths. The conventional truth is what is seen, what is perceived through the conventional analysis. And the ultimate truth is what is perceived through the ultimate analysis. So these are two different labels, but in actuality these are identical. Meaning that emptiness directly coincides with ultimate truth and dependent origination directly coincides with dependent origination directly coincides with Okay, this, we are not to go to that extent. Dependent origination and the conventional truth, these two sh should not be seen as identical, but these two should be seen as closely correlated. Closely correlated, not as identical. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why, right? Conventional truth and dependent origination, these two are not to be seen as identical. Whereas emptiness and ultimate truth these to be seen as identical. You getting it? Okay. Dependent origination and conventional truth, these two are very closely correlated, but not as identical. Don't forget it. Okay, why not identical? Anyone? Dependent origination and conventional truth. Why do these two are not identical? Anyone? Okay, anyone? Anyone? Yes. Yes, yeah, I try. Yeah. Um, I think for the dependent origination, some part of it not conventionally accepted by people. Okay. Good. Anyone else would like to add to this? How is dependent origination and the conventional <laughs> truth? So on the other hand, emptiness and ultimate truth, these two are? Identical meaning what is emptiness should be ultimate truth. What is ultimate should be emptiness. You're getting it. These two are ident mutually inclusive. These two are mutually inclusive, identical. Emptiness dependent on it. Whereas no emptiness and ultimate truth. These two are mutually inclusive. These two are identical. These two are mutually inclusive. These two are synonymous. Whereas dependent origination and conventional truth. These two are not synonymous. These two are not identical. How is there anyone? Yes, over there, Kim. I'm just wondering whether uh, I think dependent origination refers only to existence, whereas conventional truth includes existence and non-existence. Okay, this is very interesting topic. Very interesting discussion. Okay, dependent origination applies only to existent phenomena and the what conventional truth applies to both existent and non-existent. Okay, interesting. Let us not reject it, let us not accept it. Okay, anyone else? Yes, Yen. There are three levels of dependent origination. There are three levels of dependent origination. There are three levels of dependent origination. Try. Good. So I say, closer, closer. Dependent origination, there are three levels. Yes. So the third level is imputed persistence. Okay. Dependent origination has three levels, right? And third one is dependent origination of dependence on mere imputation. So what? So how is that? 
Now, how is that related or how is that not synonymous with conventional truth? Anyone? Anyone? Okay, let us do, do this quick exercise. Can you give an example of what is dependent origination as well as what is conventional truth? Very quick. Okay, this is how we analyze, right? The two things, two things here, two things here, let's say the, let's say the Singaporean, Singaporean and Singaporean on the one hand and uh, say uh, a physicist on the other hand. Let's say what's the relationship between the physicist and the Singaporeans? Okay, can you imagine someone who is a Singaporean and who is not a physicist? Can you give an example? Huh? Albert Einstein, wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, computer's hanging up. <laughs> okay, can you give an example of Singaporean? <laughs> okay, computer badly hangs up. <laughs> Not with the philosophy, even with the non philosophy things, it hangs up. <laughs> okay, so a Singaporean, a Singaporean on the one hand, and on the other hand, physicist. What's the relationship between the two? Which means, and can you think of a Singaporean who is not a physicist? Can you give an example? Most of us here, right? Most of us here, we are Singaporeans and you are not, not physicists. And can you think of a physicist who is not a Singaporean? Albert Einstein. Very good. Can you think of both someone who is a Singaporean as well as a physicist? Huh? A Singaporean physicist, right? A Singaporean physicist. Very good. Can you think of someone who is not a physicist nor a Singaporean? Okay, me. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> very good. Okay, okay, good. Now you know this. Now likewise, same dependent origination and conventional truth. Can you think of something which is dependent origination but not conventional truth? Can you think of something which is dependent origination but not conventional truth? No? Can you think of a dependent origination which is not uh, the conventional truth. So someone is saying emptiness of the object. Okay, let's keep that in mind. Let's not reject it. Let's not accept it for the time being. Can you think of a conventional truth which is not dependent origination? Emptiness of the object. conventional truth? Now, let's say, can you think of a conventional truth which is not dependent origination? Huh? Huh? Okay, non-existent flower is a conventional truth which is not independent origination. In fact, Buddha did not find any of such things, right? <laughs> Singaporeans do find that. <laughs> In fact, whatever is conventional truth should necessarily be dependent origination. In fact, if... Okay. <laughs> okay, the derivative. Well, let's work on the derivative. Derivation of emptiness and dependent origination to mean this to uh, what? To mean the same, right? Okay, let's say. Let's say. What are the five points? Okay, we we can set the five points so well. Now, anyone else who likes to reiterate, reiterate what the five points are. That is so important. Anyone? Very quick. Huh? Okay, most of you I know this very symbol. <laughs> right? Okay, now I'll say this. Oh, emptiness. First, emptiness. Point number one. Point number two. Point number two is emptiness is a short form of emptiness of independent existence. It's number two. Emptiness of independent existence means, number three, emptiness of independent existence means there is no independent existence. There's no, nothing exists independently. Nothing exists independently. Okay, nothing exists independently means, number four, that everything exists by dependence. You're getting it? Everything exists by dependence. Everything exists by dependence means everything is dependently existent or dependent originated, dependent origination. So therefore, through this derivation, we see the emptiness means the dependent origination. You're getting it? Okay. Now tell me, 
of these five points, what is the point number four? What is point number four? Everything is dependently originated. Okay, with, with this everything, conventional truth, is it included or not? Right? We have to correlate the two things. How good the computer is, this is how we, we can see. Right? Good computers are, you just put the, the, the raw feedbacks, raw information, and everything will be done by itself. Right? Now, let's see, this computer. So on the one hand, we said everything is dependent on we said it. On the other hand, we doubt whether conventional truth is dependent or is not. Conventional truth, does it exist or not? Yes. Does it fall under the category known as everything? Yes, so it should be dependent on origination, yes. yes. It's a very slow computer. <laughs> right? So therefore, every conventional truth should be dependent on origination. Now the question is, right? So whatever is B is A. What is, whatever is conventional truth should be dependent on origination. Now my question is, whatever is A, is it a B? Whatever is dependent on origination should be conventional truth. This is my question. Okay, Rosalind, do you have, would you give the answer? Your answer is correct. What you said is correct, that everything what is dependent on origination may not be, may not be conventional truth. That's very true. Okay, can you give an example? Okay, Rosalind, the mic, Rosalind? Yes. Yes, yes. The sunlight, water, everything. Mm -hmm. So the apple is dependent on all this process. Yes. Yeah. So, but ultimately, um, uh, how should I say? Apple is dependent on this, but ultimately, apple is a conventional truth. Apple is conventional truth, yeah. and it is dependent on originated. Whatever is conventional truth should be dependent on originated. Very good. But apple is not the sun. Now the next question is. What is dependently originated? Whatever is dependently originated, should it be conventional truth? Yes, the question. Yes, no? No or no? Huh? Okay, what example do you have? Yes, we can. Very good. Ultimate truth, is it dependent originated or not? Is it existent or not? Thank you, Rosalind. Ultimate truth, is it existent or not? Hey, computer badly hangs now. <laughs> Com ultimate, ultimate truth, does it exist or not? Yes. yes, it is so precious. It exists. It's so precious. You see this and then your, your nightmare of samsara dissolves, right? And you're wondering, your computer hangs that it doesn't know whether it exists or not. Okay, now ultimate truth does exist. If it exists, it should be dependent and originated. You said it or not? You said... Whatever is, everything should be dependent on originated. This is what you have learned. You're getting it? So ultimate truth is dependent on originated, but it is not conventional truth. You're getting it? Ultimate truth, is it a conventional truth? Ultimate truth, is it a conventional truth? Why not? Okay, now this is my challenge to you. Okay, give the, I'll give you time. Take your time and let me know. How do you say that ultimate truth is not conventional truth? Okay, think in various ways, whatever angle you would like to give the answer. Um, think it that way and let me know. Okay, raise your hands. How can you explain that ultimate truth is not conventional truth? Try to get the information from what you have learned. Right? There are so many information from which we can deduce that the ultimate truth is not conventional truth. Uh -huh. Okay. What is that truth which is found by the ultimate analysis? Ultimate truth. Do you find the conventional truth by the ultimate analysis? We will never find, right? Okay, what, what do you find through the, what is that reality or truth which is found under the ultimate analysis? Ultimate truth. So anything which is found through ultimate analysis is known as ultimate truth. Anything which is found through conventional analysis is known as conventional truth, right? So in fact, what, what X-ray group A is keeping? Which X-ray? X-ray of conventional truth. So you have the conventional the X-ray and then you don't know what is coming out of that. 
What is coming out of that? Confession and truth, right? And hey, which x-ray you are keeping? And what is coming out of this confession, the ultimate your, your x-ray? Ultimate truth is coming out. So what has been ultimate truth? If somebody asks, if somebody asks, what is the ultimate truth? You should give the answer. Because you are keep, keep, keeping the ultimate truth, ultimate analysis x-ray. And if somebody asks, what is conventional truth? They should ask you. You should be able to give the answer. Okay, tell me. What is conventional truth? Hey, group A. Anything which, anything which is found Anything which, which is found through conventional analysis, okay? <laughs> okay, later on, when you go back to Singapore, what is ultimate truth? Okay. Anything which comes out of the X-ray, <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> this, is a, this is just an example given, don't say this, right? Anything which is found, anything which is found by ultimate, not through ultimate analysis is known as ultimate truth. Okay, now tell me, what is conventional truth? No. <laughs> just, you are you are the you are see convention. Okay, what is the ultimate truth? Anything which 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 anything which is found by anything which is found through through ultimate analysis is known as ultimate truth. What examples do you have? What examples do you have? Okay, say if you put this flower in this, what comes out of that? And the flower comes out of that. And if the emptiness of the flower is put in there, what comes out of that? Emptiness of, emptiness of the flower. You're getting it? Okay. Now tell me, emptiness of the flower, does it come from this x-ray or this x-ray? Emptiness of the emptiness of the flower. Huh? Emptiness of the emptiness of the flower, from which the true x-ray it comes from? Okay. Okay, you, your x-ray, does it, emptiness, emptiness of the emptiness of the flower, does it come from your x-ray or not? No. From your, yes, no. Okay, they don't know that they actually, how it works, they do not know. <laughs> right? If I put the emptiness of the flower, what comes out of this? If I put the emptiness of the emptiness of the flower from this, what comes out of this? And you said it doesn't come out of this. <laughs> it does come out. It comes out of both, from both. But how they come out is different. Because in your case, in order for you, in order for your X-ray to come, make the emptiness of emptiness of the flower to come out, what should be put in? You should be, no, don't put the flower. <laughs> if you put the flower, what will come out? Flower will come out. <laughs> okay, tell me. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, tell me, if you want, in, in your machine, if the emptiness of the emptiness of flower should come out, what should you put in? <laughs> emptiness of flower should be put in. Whereas in your case, if you want to see the emptiness of emptiness of flower to come out, what should you put in? And just the emptiness of flower. You're getting it? In your machine, in your machine, emptiness of the flower, does it come out or not? Hey, the group A. Emptiness of flower, does it come out of that? Yes. It comes out. If you want this to come out, what should be put in? Emptiness of flower should be put in. In your machine, emptiness of flower, does it come out or not? Yes. It does come out. How does it come out? For, for this, what should be put out? What should you put in? You just put in the flower. You don't put in the emptiness of the flower as we do here. <laughs> if you put in the emptiness of the flower, what will come out? Emptiness. Emptiness, emptiness will come out. So the difference is, although emptiness of flower can come from both machines, how they come is very different input should be very different, right? So, only if you put in the flower, or the emptiness of the flower, then the emptiness of the flower comes out. Here, if you put the, the, the what, the flower, right, what will come out? Flower will not come out, it will come out, emptiness of the flower. If you put in the emptiness of the flower, what will come out? Emptiness, emptiness of the flower will come out, not the emptiness of the flower. You're getting it? Okay. So now, um, okay, so, now with this, the truth, with the two truths, we see that, okay, now tell me, where are we? Where are we? Hey. <laughs> we are in Jambi. <laughs> okay, we are in Jambi. Okay, which country are we are in? Indonesia. Malaysia, right? Or oh, Indonesia. 
Okay, we are in Jambi and in Indonesia. Okay, what are we doing? We are, for what for we came here? For Bodhisattva retreat. Okay, tell me. That we are in Jambi, that we are in Indonesia, that we come here, that we come here for Bodhisattva retreat. Is this something true or not? True. Okay. Now to speak about emptiness, to speak about emptiness, right? To speak about emptiness, always don't start from emptiness directly. <clears throat> start from the facts. Start from the facts. Are we in? Are we? Are we um, in the process of the Bodhicitta retreat in Jambi? Yes. Start from there. Two questions. Two questions. Are we in Jambi? Yes. Does Jambi exist? Yes. Okay, let's start from there. Let's start from a very simple question. Then you can make it complicated yourself later on. First, the Jambi. Let's see. Jambi, does it exist? Yes. Okay, don't be hesitant. Okay, Jambi, does it exist? Yes. Okay, so this is this conventional analysis or ultimate analysis? Conventional analysis. This, if you, re if you deny, if you deny that we are in Jambi, then we fall into nihilism, right? If you deny the fact that we are in Jambi, we are, we are falling, we are falling into nihilism. So we have to start from this: Are we in Jambi? Jambi does it exist? The answer is yes. The first, what is the first question? Are we in Jambi? Does Jambi exist? This is the first question, right? Okay. To this, what is the answer? Yes. The next question, does Jambi exist objectively? No. You're getting it? Does Jambi exist objectively? We say no. There are two questions. What's the first question? Does Jambi exist? What's the second question? Does Jambi exist objectively? Two questions. <clears throat> so, to the first question, to the first question, with the first question, the answer that you get is the conventional truth. You get the conventional truth. To the second question, answer that you get is the ultimate truth. Right? Does Jambi exist? The answer is yes, Jambi exists. That is conventional truth. Second question, what is the second question? Does Jambi exist objectively? What is the answer? No, Jambi does not exist objectively. The emptiness of objective existence of the Jambi. That is the ultimate truth. You're getting it? When you speak about emptiness, it never touches the first question. It touches only the second question. Right? When you speak about emptiness. So, when you say, oh, in Buddhism there is no, there's nothing there. There's no, there's no self. There's nothing. Um, everything is empty, emptiness. Okay, is this a good answer? Is this a good? Is this a good statement or a, is a good statement or a bad statement? It's a bad statement. How that is a bad statement? Because this is mixing of the two, the answers to the two questions. The two questions should be treated separately. You're getting it? Okay. Now tell me. Okay, does Jambi exist? Yes. So this is this is speaking about the ultimate truth or the conventional truth? Conventional truth. Which means conventionally Jambi exists. Don't forget the two questions. Does that object exist? And what is the second question? Does the object exist objectively? Don't forget the two questions. With the two questions, the two truths will come out so easily, so clearly. Does Jambi exist? The answer is yes. We don't deny this existence. Does the law of karma exist? Law of karma exists. The three jewels exist? Three jewels exist. Right? Okay. So from this we see that the happiness, suffering, they all exist? Yes, they all exist. We are talking about what? Which of two truths? Conventional truth? Because we are dealing with the, the answers to the first question. What is the second question? Does Jampi exist objectively or does the law of karma exist objectively? What is your answer? No. Which means we are dealing with the, which of the truth? Ultimate truth. Ultimately, karma does not exist or 
say ultimately karma doesn't exist or the karma doesn't exist objectively but this is not the answer to the first question right the first question says the karma does exist right karma does exist which means that karma exists but it does not exist objectively okay with this now tell me do you see contradiction between the two things two things when i say the karma exists and on the other hand i say karma does not exist objectively are these two contradictory or these two complementary complementary very good because because when you say say this is karma when i say karma exists means you are looking at karma from the conventional analysis when you say karma does it exist objectively when you say no you are looking from the ultimate analysis so these two are the two perceptions of the same object you are getting it of the same object means there is no contradiction it's the same object within the same object two can be harmoniously two can two can be together two can be together in a great complementarity right two can be together compatibly right so the same object is seen as flower the same object is seen as law of karma same object is seen as emptiness of law of karma when you look at it from the ultimate analysis you are getting it so these two are with the same object different objects the same object because of which these two are not contradictory right so when we say that the law of karma does not exist objectively you are implying that law of karma does exist conventionally so therefore we have to respect the law of karma if lost respect law of karma because it does exist it's not that that it is totally non existent it does exist conventionally it is, does exist so the question is law of karma does it exist or not the answer is yes then the buddha is talking about it does the emptiness 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 so what is buddha talking about he is talking about the ultimate in the ultimate sense nothing exists conventionally everything exists so this is known as the harmony of two thoughts harmony of two thoughts you getting it how many two thoughts now what i like to share with you is that say say you have a say you have a sever you have a sever the t strainer what is the job of the t strainer what is the job of the t strainer how many of you you, you know how to use t strainer huh what a tea strainer yes how was the job of this huh okay the girls should be able to say this and some girls may say why only girl why not the boys <laughs> right so um, i'll say the why why not the boys i'll tell you recently my brother's daughter my nephew niece two of them came to came to stay with me and then we made we made some vegetarian momos not not uh, not meat momos vegetarian momos vegetarian momos and then there was some extra left and then we were sending to the another say one of our relatives and then so they were in my house so i was taking care of packing all these things after packing then the little bit of chili sauce also sent and then i also put a one a small plastic a spoon to make sure that otherwise how to put this sauce sauce is very spicy and without a spoon how can you put it so i put the i added a, a small tiny uh, what teaspoon there to use for the sauce and this young girl was watching me this young girl was watching me and she said uncle you look like a girl <laughs> <laughs> you are doing you you are doing like a girl <laughs> so confused why why you say i'm doing like a girl she said because you're so particular you're so particular the say the, the momos then they the, the look for the precise containers the spice there and then even the spoon you put there this is to be sent out and they'll be discarded even the spoon make sure that the person this is what the boys don't do <laughs> this all the girls they're so concerned to make sure that everything's so precise so concerned about others the girls are good at that and you are like a girl you you don't like a girl this is what she said okay so the tea strainer back to street and then we will break for the short break tea break tea strainer what is the job of the tea strainer so as sonamala said to separate the tea leaves and 
the tea, not water, the tea, right? <laughs> okay, then it becomes a very special machine. <laughs> tea leaf, tea leaf, and the water separated, and the, the where is the drinkable tea is gone, <laughs> right? Okay, the, the tea leaves and the drinkable tea, drinkable tea. So two separate the two, right? Okay, now the wisdom of emptiness. This is amazing. It serves like a tea tra tea strainer. With the wisdom emptiness, what happens is that it will just hold back or it'll stop. It'll stop. It'll stop all the negative emotions. It'll stop all the negative emotions. The wisdom of emptiness. When you see the, the wisdom emptiness, this wisdom emptiness, it'll stop all the negative emotions and it'll freely let go. It will freely let flow. It will freely let flow the drinkable tea. Right? It will stop all the negative emotions and it will flee, freely let flow the positive emotions. It will not stop the positive emotions. It will stop all the negative emotions such as attachment, anger, jealousy, competitiveness, fear, anxiety, tension, stress, lamentation, so forth. It will stop all these, but it will freely let flow your positive emotions such as compassion, empathy, generosity, patience and so forth. All these positive emotions, it will freely let flow. Right? You are so rich with the positive emotions and all the negative emotions, it will simply destroy or stop. You are getting it? Okay. So, the, um, so this is the purpose. Now, now, what we see is that this is one way of understanding the benefit of the understanding of emptiness. Now, another way is we speak, we speak about the emptiness and dependent origination as the two sides of the same coin. With the emptiness, what it happens? With the emptiness, you see that nothing exists objectively. Right? So, there's nothing there from the object to which your mind can, which, which can potentially pull your mind. There's nothing there from the object which can pull your mind, so the mind rests. There's nothing there from the object which pushes you involuntarily, so the mind takes rest. So this is because it rests from being pulled and pushed, being pulled and pushed. Involuntary pull and push is stopped because of understanding emptiness. Now on the other hand, the positive qualities should not be stopped. Positive qualities should not be stopped, right? Compassion, all these things should continue to happen. So this continues to happen on the basis of the, what's the other, other side of emptiness? What is, what is the other side of emptiness? Dependent origination, right? By, depend, uh, by understanding dependent origination, your positive qualities can grow. But you know that it is by dependence on cherishing others that my happiness will grow. And what I want is my happiness. I, what I want is happiness and my happiness grows by cherishing others. It is by subduing the self-centered attitude that other cherishing increases by increase by dependence on subduing the, uh, the self-centered attitude. Other cherishing originates, dependent origination. Right? By dependence on the other cherishing increasing, Right? My happiness originates dependent origination. By understanding dependent origination, all the positive qualities grow. Right? By understanding emptiness, all the negative thoughts stop. All the negative emotions stop. All negative emotions stop. And this will lead you to nirvana. This will lead you to freedom from samsara. Now with the help of compassion, with the help of dependent origination, your compassion grows. By the practice of by seeing, by seeing how, how dependent I am on other sentient beings, you feel so grateful to others. By feeling the great, by dependence on feeling gratitude towards others, others, you shower, you shower goodness on others. By dependence on showering goodness on others, you reap the maximum benefit that is originated, dependent origination. By understanding dependent origination, we see that all the positive qualities grow. So the Bodhisattvas, for the Bodhisattvas, it is not just stopping the negative, the negativities, mental defilements. It's not just stopping the negativities, but they should also grow the compassion. So for the Bodhisattvas, understand emptiness, understand dependent origination, both are equally important. Both are equally important. They make sure that just as you understand emptiness, 
you equally meditate on the dependent origin, how things are all dependent originated. So now, when you see that there's no objective existence, there's no objective existence, and still things are operating where? There's no objective existence, still things are operating where? Subjectively. Then it becomes like a dream, it becomes like an illusion. So, now bodhisattvas, within this experience of the illusion like, then they see the dependent origination. Nothing there from the object independently. It's all coming through dependence in the illusion, in the, in the form of a dream like, in the form of illusion like. So, Lama Tsongkhapa advised, advised that whenever, by seeing things as empty, as empty object reality, and seeing things all illusion like, all your virtues must be done in the spirit of illusion like nature. Okay, I'm making illusion, I'm making prostrations. By making this illusion like prostrations, then the illusion like merit is accumulated. Because of this illusion like, say, the, the gati gati happens, right? So, in the spirit of illusion like nature, then one has to operate the, the virtues. So, this is advice given by Lama Sungapa. So, with this, what happens? In the pursuit of your journey of the, the virtue, right? You are never trapped. You are never trapped by seeing things as objectively because you constantly see them as illusory. You're getting it? Okay, this is a very, very precious piece of advice. Okay, we'll stop here. Three prostrations.